today is going to be the last lecture. And also I will show past exam questions and we can, we can also discuss some of that as well. Okay, so I'm going to start by going back to the very, just the very first example we, we started with. So this is the example we had in the first lecture for a cantilever. Okay, so this is the problem we have been discussing throughout the entire course. We have a cantilever. The cantilever is, lead, is loaded with some force, it's fixed at this end, and is loaded with some force at the free end. We solve this just like one dimensional problem. If you are using static to solve, if you are using mechanics to solve this problem, you need to find the stress to be F divided by A. So this is the amount of the stress you would have. Now, this is meant to be representing a real life problem. So if you want to think about a real life scenario, you probably can think about a reinforced concrete beam. So you have a beam. And for the time being, I'm just going to ignore this end. Let us assume that this beam is reinforced. I mean, the beam is certainly not going to take tension if we're talking about concrete. So there must be some reinforcement in this beam, this bar, in this case, beam. And we have a force F applied here. Now, this force is a point force, so it is applied at one point. But in the reality, this is not true. I mean, you cannot have a force that is applied at one point. You cannot have a force applied at a zero area. This is something cannot exist in real life. So this must be representing something else. I probably you have some sort of a, a ring in there. Probably this ring is going to undergo some tension, and this tension is resulting into this concentrated force. Now you are converting. I mean, see, we're starting to convert one point with zero area into some sort of a holder or an anchor. And this anchor now has two legs. These two legs would have some area. There are no zero area in there. And since they are anchored, then the force is probably going to be applied throughout the entire face. And then we have this to be modeled just like a concentrated force. It is probably not that, it's probably some sort of a hook. I don't know, I mean, can think about different possibilities. Probably it's going to be a hook. The hook is anchored. And then again, if it is anchored, it is still one point of application, but then the stress or the force is going to be applied throughout the entire contact surface on the concrete. Now, if it is the case, we also need to take care into, into holding the hook through the reinforcement as well, probably. So this is something we, we also need to take care of. And then you have the interaction between the, the bars and the concrete, which is going to be a complex behavior. Now, you are ignoring all this information And you're assuming that this is just a one-dimensional problem. You have a point load, and then you have a force applied, and you have the stress to be F over A, <coughs> which is correct if you get away from the support, if you move away from the support. This would start to make sense. But closer to the support, closer to the point of application, this is not correct. Now, do you know how we can move from these different cases? And by the way, both of them would be represented exactly in the same way if we are talking about one dimensional problem, and they would be represented in this way. Do you know how we move from these different cases into this simple case? What assumption do we make? Or do you know the mathematical or the mechanical principle behind this move? from these more complex scenarios into this simple one. 
I'm, I'm talking probably to postgraduate students here. Probably they have seen this in the past or they studied this in their undergraduate level. Anyone? All right, so we are able to do this because the diameter of the anchor, no, I mean, yes, yeah, so the diameter of the anchor would certainly change, and this would result into different possibilities. But I'm, I'm asking, do you know how we ignore this local impact of this local effects and we move into this general picture here? All right, so we do this because we use the sand venant principle. Now, the sand venant would state that if you get away from the point of application, I mean, if you move a bit away from the point of the application of the force, then the force is not going to, so the stresses and the strains will not be impacted by the, these local effects. So if you move away into the body of this cantilever, then in this case, whatever impact, whatever local effects you have in there are not going to impact you. So you are going to kind of isolate yourself from these local effects. Now, this is possible if you are using this type of modeling, but it is not the case once you get into the finite element model. I mean, I'm going to probably just start fresh. Now, if you have this type of beam or this type of cantilever, and you want to solve this problem using the finite element method, this is F, if you want to do that, you can either solve this exact problem, exactly this one, just use a one-dimensional bar element, the one we have been using so far, or simplify this into a two-dimensional problem where the two-dimensional problem will reflect exactly this one-dimensional case. I mean, in this case, you will be benefiting nothing at all from having the two-dimensional case, but you would be solving exactly the one-dimensional problem. Okay, I mean, you would be solving it in 2D, but it is going to be still the one-dimensional problem. Now, to understand this, I've prepared an example for you. So I've picked this one-dimensional problem here. So the forces or the stress in this case, so you have 1,000 kilo Newton load, and you have this type of cross-section, so the stress should be around 1,000 kilonewton per square meter. Let us assume that you have a theoretical case where you get the stress to be 1,000 kilonewton per square meter. Now, I want to solve this in two dimensions, and I want to model everything you have in this 1D into the two dimensions. Now, as I said, the stress should be 1,000 if you are solving the one-dimensional problem. Now, let us look into what you get into the two-dimensional case. Now, I'm looking into the possibilities. You have the possibility of introducing this force here, F, as a concentrated force, as a force applied at one point, and this is the 1,000. And then you have the cross-section. You know the dimension of this cross-section. And then on this end, you fix displacement in X and in Y. So this would be the first thing to Come into, my, to come into my head, the displacement here are fixed and the force is applied as a point force. So I would do this. Now, the second thing, and since we are moving into a two-dimensional case, instead of having the force applied at zero area, I mean, in one dimension, you have zero area. Let us assume that the force is actually distributed because this is the two-dimensional case, so the force is distributed per, per area. Now, this 1,000 is distributed into a uniformly distributed force where the resultant of this it is, is still 1,000. So this can be my second case. Now, this end is still fixed. I'm thinking in completely fixed in the x and the z, in the x and the y directions. Now, let us move one step further. I mean, if you think about the support, the support here is actually only fixed in this direction. It's only fixed in the x direction, right? I mean, this is one dimension, 
And for one dimensional case, you have the displacements only to be fixed in one dimension in the x axis. So this is the x axis, and then you only fix the displacement in the x axis. Now I'm going to do exactly the same. I'm just going to fix the displacement in the x axis. But since I'm solving a two dimensional problem, and in order to keep equilibrium intact, I have to put something to stop the beam from moving in this direction. So I'm just going to add one support. This single support will stop or will satisfy the equilibrium. So think about it that the beam is not going to fall down. But at the same time, this support here is not going to impact on the behavior of this beam because, I mean, think about it. You apply a force, there will be Poisson ratio. The Poisson ratio will try to shrink the beam. So this is going to expand in the x direction and shrink in the y direction because of the Poisson ratio, right? So since this beam is only fixed at this point, it's going to shrink and move downward, so it is completely free to shrink. Whereas in this case, this is not free to shrink. Also in this case here, this is not free to shrink. So this is going to result into stresses in this direction, and this is going to result into stresses in this direction. Right Now, these are three different models representing the same problem, the same one-dimensional problem, and I think this one would be very close to the one-dimensional case. I'm doing a two-dimensional problem that is actually representing a one-dimensional case. Okay, now I've modeled this on LUSAS, I've solved these beams, I've obtained the stresses in the x direction, so sigma x, and sigma x should be equal to 1,000. This is what we have calculated by hand for the one-dimensional case. Now let us look into this one here first. This is the results I have from LUSAS. If you look into the results from LUSAS, you will see that the stress is varying hugely between six, 650 kilonewton per square meter to around 6,000 kilonewton per square meter. Now, as to be expected, the stress is really concentrated at this point. And this is normal because the force you apply here is applied at zero area. Now, F divided by zero is going to go to infinity. So the stress at this point here is infinitely large. Now, you don't see this in the one dimensional case. But this is, the, this is the reality once you move into multi-dimensions. Multi once you get into the multi-dimensions, you are dividing a force by zero area, and this is going to result into infinitely larger stress. Now, this is giving me over 6,000, but if I refine my mesh, this number is going to grow, and it's going to keep to grow up to 100,000 probably, or 1 million or 10 million, keep refining, you keep getting larger and larger values for the stress because you are getting closer and closer to the zero area scenario. And this is going to be reflected in your stresses. Now, do you actually design for 1 million kilonewton per square meter? Do you really design for that? This is no way to design for it. So this is why you need to be aware of the singularities and you need to be careful not to kind of distort your design because you have a singularity in there. So this is, this is a very strong singularity in, 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 in this case. Now, compared to this first model here, compared to model number one, I have model number two plotted on the same contour scale. Now, this is plotted on the same scale between 650 to 6,000. Plotted on the same scale, you see that this is quite a uniform pattern of the stress, and it entirely falls within the range between 650 to 1,300. Now, as I said, you look into the stress in this case, you see that the stress is uniform. This probably looks like what you would be expected, or what would you be expecting in the one-dimensional case. But there's still some range into that. So probably 600 to 1,300 is, is a wide range. You really want to zoom on this range. And you see what happens when you zoom on this range. So I had to replot 
the second model only for this range. So I've re-plotted this beam number two, and then I've used the range 650, and the maximum is, the new range is 1,380 or 18. Now, this is the second model plotted on this range. Now, this is 650, so the minimum here is around 650, and the maximum here is 1,000 something, so that I've really zoomed onto this specific range. I really want to look into this specific range and see how the stress would vary in there. Now, once you zoom onto this range, you will start to see how the contours would look like at the support. Now, other than the support, you'll see that the stress looks pretty much uniform. But this local effect of the support will start to show. As you remember, I mentioned that the support is going to, I mean, the beam is going to try and shrink, but the support is fixing the beam. So the support is fixed here and fixed here. So this is going to try and, and shrink in the y direction, but this is not going to be possible because the support is fixed. So this is going to try and shrink away from the support, but because the support is not letting go, this is going to result into stresses that are happening in, in the vertical direction as well. Now, if you look into the stresses there, you see that you have large stresses happening also at the tips here. And this is the location where you have a force trying to pull in this direction and a force trying to pull in this direction. I mean, this is a virtual force. This is a reaction force. But it is going to also have this impact of force applied at zero area, and it's going again to result into singularity. Now, this singularity is not so strong as the one we had in this point here, but there's still some singularity in there. And if you refine, you see that the value of the stress in this point will keep increasing. Now, the increase is dying out quite quickly so that the region affected by this singularity is relatively small. But if you refine really fine, or if you go really fine mesh on the corners, you see that the value of the stress will keep growing. Again, this is some sort of an artificial effect, but it is, now I'm, now I'm talking about, it is a real effect as well. Because if you look into the stress that is going to be happening at these corners there, it's going to be relatively large. And if your beam, suppose that this is the case, suppose that you actually fix your beam from displacing in this direction and in this direction, this is completely fixed in the X and the Y, the beam is actually going to try to shrink and this is certainly going to result into stresses in this vertical direction. And if your beam, I mean, your beam is certainly supported. I mean, if we talk about reinforced concrete, your beam is probably supported for longitudinal stresses in the tension, but there will be tension in the vertical direction happening at the corners, and certainly the corners of your beam are going to break. So this is certainly going to happen. So you'll have some cracks happening at the corners of your beam. Now, these cracks probably not going to have a huge impact on, you, on the behavior of your beam, because the main effect is happening in the longitudinal direction, but nevertheless, you'll have some cracks in there and the material will, will decay in these points here. Now, compared to that, I've plotted case number three, also on the same scale, and on the same scale, case number three looks pretty much uniform. If you look into the range, the range is running between 962 to 1,000, 18, 1019 almost. Now, this is a narrow range, but still some range, so I can really zoom on that. And this is what I did. I zoomed on this range and plotted this guy. I saw that this is still uniform. I had to zoom again for the third and the fourth and the fifth time. I kept zooming. I kept getting uniform value for the stress. And eventually, I found that this is entirely under 1,000 kilonewton per square meter. So this is exactly the one-dimensional case. Now, the question would be why I would bother having these local effects if I can represent the one-dimensional case. The opposite question is why I would bother using the finite element method if I can solve this in one-dimensional 
problem, a very simple one-dimensional problem. So there's no point of doing finite elements if you are going to simplify your model to the extent that it is actually representing the one-dimensional case. The advantage of the finite element method would happen in the cases where you have a two-dimensional problem and represent this two-dimensional problem accurately and have the accurate value for the stress and design your problem accurately. Now, if you, if you do this, you would certainly get some cracks in there. I mean, I, I cannot assume that you are going to let your beam to be flexible in the vertical direction. So you'd still get some cracks in there, but you would never know why this crack has happened. But if you actually represent the support that you have, the exact type of the support you have, and the exact type of the load you have, then you are going to have exact description of how the problem is going to behave in the real world. And this is the power of the finite element method. Now, you have done something similar in your coursework. You try to build, I mean, I've tried to show you this in the second coursework. So you have multi-support conditions. Some of them would be very relevant to the beam theory you have used but some of them would be completely different. Now, which ones are the accurate ones? The ones that are accurate are the ones that you are going to have in real world. I mean, this is the ones you are going to design for, basically. What I'm thinking now about is you being an engineer in a real life scenario, trying to design a beam now. Now, think about it in this way. You have a concrete beam. And the concrete beam is fixed. Now, this is, I mean, I mean, fixing it on paper is easy, but fixing it in the real world is a completely different case. Now, fixing this in the real world would probably mean that this cantilever is fixed to a wall, probably a shear wall, and then you have the reinforcement running between the beam and the wall. And then having a small, I mean, usually the wall would be not thick enough for the beam to be anchored into the wall, probably need to bend and properly anchor this reinforcement so that you have both things connected properly. I mean, this can be a case. Probably you are not talking about reinforced concrete bar. Probably you are talking about a steel bar. And this steel bar is anchored into a concrete wall or into a concrete block. Now, probably this will need to have some, again, anchorage depth into that. And this is probably good enough or probably not good enough, you really need to add some extra support that this will have enough area to support the anchorage of this bar here. Now, how would you know how to design this? Usually, if we're talking about the, if you're talking about your life with the structures that are you familiar with, we are building a, a I, don't know, I don't know, three floors residential block. If you are doing that, what you need to do is just do one dimensional problems, beams or bars, and then the code is going to tell you how to design these supports exactly. So it's going to tell you exactly, you design the, you design the beams, you design the columns, and then the code is going to tell you exactly how to connect them together. So the code is protecting you from moving into this area of how this is actually going to behave. And for designing three blocks residential houses, you don't need to use the finite element methods. I, I, I certainly can tell you that. However, once you move into an area where things are not quite clear, I, the finite element method is mainly designed, is very useful also for this residential building for unconventional loads. For example, if we're talking about, I don't know, an explosion next to this residential building, then in this case, this explosion cannot be covered. I mean, it's not covered until recently in the design codes, but you can always think about loading cases that are not possible to, to, to take care of in the, in the codes. So there will be also some use for that, but it is also very useful for structures that you have not done in the past. I mean, think about, I don't know, probably, for example, the Burj Khalifa in, in, in UAE. This is the world's highest, highest building. And we're talking about almost seven or 800 meters there. 
There is no design code that can cover that. You are in uncharted water and you really need to design this yourself and you take the full responsibility for it, all right? So as a designer, in this sort of cases, you would decide on how to support your team. It is not the decision of someone else. Now, if it is a verification case, if someone, for example, would tell you, go and see Edinburgh Castle, I want to make sure that Edinburgh Castle will stand an impact of, of an explosion or will stand an impact of an earthquake. I mean, earthquakes are not very, very common in Edinburgh, but let us assume that some earthquake would happen and then I really want to see if I need to do any support for the Edinburgh Castle or would it stand an earthquake of magnitude five, for example. Now, in this case, you go there, you measure exactly what is happening in this castle and you represent this using the fire element method, all right? In this case, you have something that is very concrete, very clear. Now, it is going to be your job to have an accurate representation for that and see how this is going to behave in real life scenario. Okay? okay. So it is not going to be the case ever that someone is going to give you a finite element model, a random finite element model, just like I did in this coursework, probably only for the coursework you will have that, and ask you to verify that. You are going to be over, I mean, you are going to be the, the, the person in charge, the person who is going to control this. So, stress singularity would happen when you have force applied at zero area. So, force concentrated at zero area, this is going to be an infinitely larger stress. But it also happens in other cases. Another case where you have a stress singularity is if you have a huge stiffness next to a very soft material. I mean, think about, for example, a concrete block placed on top, on top of a soft soil. Then at the corners, you would have a stress singularity. So this is a, another case where you have a huge increase in the stress. It can be realistic, it can be not, but it depends really on the, on the scenario. And this is something you need to, to take care of. I mean, if you have a very stiff concrete block on top of soft soil, you really have a huge value of the stress happening at the corners, and you need to take care of that. It will also happen in re-entrant corners, I mean, if you have a re-entrant corner, then the re-entrant corner would always have a stress singularity into it. And if you have a crack, once you have a crack, once a crack is initiated, the crack tip will have infinitely large value for the stress. So if you are thinking about the cracks, cracks would also have sing singularities at their crack tips. And this is why cracks would grow very quickly. I mean, if we're talking about bricks and material, for example, glass, if a crack would be initiated, the crack can propagate through the glass in, in no time. It's really very quick. I mean, the speed of crack propagation can be in kilometers per second. It depends on how brittle the material can be. So this can be really very quick. Now, this is the case because you have a stress singularity at the crack tip. I mean, it depends. I mean, you don't have infinitely large stress, obviously, in real world, but how, how close it is to, to large is going to result into the crack propagating really fast. All right, so this would be three main cases for stress singularities, apart from the case that you, this is a hypothetical case. And the example I've, I've told Kamal about is in the, in the 40s and the 50s, if you, if you look into the design for airplanes, for example, you'll see that windows for airplane used to be square, used to be rectangles. So all the windows on airplane used to be rectangles. And they noticed that these rectangular windows will always have a cracks at the corners. This is always going to be the case. Now to deal with this, I mean, they realized that this is stress singularities happening at these re-entrant corners. And they had to redesign windows on airplane to make them rounded. So they have this oval shape. I mean, all the, all the windows on all, all airplanes, they have this oval shape because they cannot accommodate these sharp corners. I mean, they would always result into cracks. And we, I mean, if you see that designs we have in nowadays, you'll see that we always try to avoid these very sharp corners. We, we always try to fillet this type of corners so that we don't have these stress singularities happening in them. So this is, for example, some way to go around the stress singularity. 
So as a designer, it is your job to find what is the answer for that. All right. I'm going to talk briefly about why we use the finite element method. I mean, as I said, if it is possible to, to design a three dimension of the three, three, uh, three floors residential block using, using the design code without any, any finite element into that. So why would we use the finite element method? You would be using the finite element method. I mean, first of all, to pr produce optimum designs. If you are designing with the codes, it's certainly not optimum designs. Reduce the chance of failure, especially for cases that are extreme loading. I mean, you think about scenarios that are not possible to consider conventionally. And to run tests, um, you can run tests on the material properties. You can run tests on full scale model. This is something you can do with the finite element methods. And you can also develop an understanding for the behavior of a structure. I mean, think about, again, the design codes probably going to work for certain type of structures, but it's going to work on these parts of the structure individually. You don't have this holistic vision of the, of the structure and its behavior. And you have cases, for example, if we're talking about, a, I don't know, if you're talking about a, a power plant, there'll be quite a few scenarios for cases, for structures that would be really behaving in different ways that you cannot predict unless you really calculate these sort of behaviors. So this is the typical use for the finite element method in the designing process. And if we're talking about assessment, for example, as I said, if you want to assess a historical structure, you really want to understand how this historical structure, or if you if you have an existing structure that has been designed 50 years ago, you really want to see how this structure is going to behave under a specific type of loads or under a specific type of scenarios, then this is something you can use the finite element for. So it is very useful for assessment. It is also useful for litigation. This is recent use for the finite element method. So you can actually use the finite element method to present evidence at a court. So this can support a witness or can, can present an evidence in a court using the finite element method. This is really new. And obviously, you can use this for research. So for research, you can also use the finite element method. I mean, you can use it in so many different ways for, for doing research. And I mean, the, the main advantages for the finite element method is fast, accurate, and detailed. So you, the, level, the level of details you can cover in the finite element method is, is, is something really we didn't have in the past. So it really can get into the depth of the details of your structure. And it is very accurate compared to other methods we have. And it is very fast. Now, this is accurate and detailed. It depends really on you how you use it. If you are capable of using it properly, it can be very accurate. If you are not able to use it accurately, it's going to produce loads of rubbish that will make absolute no sense. And if you base your decisions on this rubbish, then it's going to be a very bad use for the fire element method. So this is very important. And this is why I try to focus on, on understanding the basics of the method. So when you use it, you know exactly what is it that you're using. All right. So the fire element method, if you are going to use it, then I would suggest probably you ask yourself these questions. First of all, see if it does contribute to the problem. As I said, a residential block is probably too straightforward to use a finite element method for. So does it actually contribute anything? I, I would be overcomplicating the problem if I use it for designing this type of structures. So probably there is no need for that. And also you need to ask yourself, what are the results you are looking for? I mean, if this is just a standard design, you are not interested in any non-conventional cases, then probably you also don't need the finite element method. So it depends really on the type of results you are expecting. And see how much details you need to know about the design. I mean, I would ask yourself, I probably I would ask myself this question every time I would use the finite element method, or probably every time I try to solve a problem, any problem. I would also really want to know exactly what sort of expectations I have toward the end of the solution, what type of details I want to have in the problem is going to depend a lot on what type of answers I want to have at the end. So these fundamental type of questions, you really need to ask yourself, I mean, as a designer, just not just as someone who's going to use the finite element methods. 
Now, the vast majority of you will end up using file attainment packages, software that is commercial, and probably you are going to, to I mean, it's just quite few of them. It depends really on what type of industry you end up with, probably what country you work with, uh, what country you work in. You will see that there will be different software packages. And if you understand the basics of the file attainment method, it's going to be easy to learn this software. I mean, if you don't, then it's going to be just a struggle for you to learn the software. And once you learn the software, probably if you move to, to another software, it's going to be another learning journey for you. But if you understand the basics, I think you can easily learn this software. Now, as a software user, you will have two things to deal with. It is the pre-processing. It is when you create your model and include your assumptions and include and define your boundary conditions, define the loads you have in there. And then you have the analysis engine. This is the black box. This is where the actual finite element would happen. And then this analysis is going to give you results into the post-processing phase. So as a user, you would mainly deal with the pre-processing and post-processing. What I've tried to cover in this course mainly was related to the analysis engine because your decisions on the pre-processing and the post-processing would rely a lot on what happens inside this black box. So you really need to be aware of what is going on in there. But eventually, once you get into industry, it is going to be the pre-processing and the post-processing that you really are going to work with. Okay, but as I said, it depends. I'm going to come to, to that in a minute, but your choices at the pre-processing phase will really determine what sort of analysis is going to happen and will, will be reflected in the post-processing phase. And nowadays, I'm, I mean, yeah, so, Nowadays, you probably know this already, that these fire element packages are in, integrated with CAD systems, integrated with word editing, so you can really produce results and summarize results and produce reports quite easily. I mean, even in LUSAS, if you look, there will be some sort of a report production facility in there. You can produce, a, I mean, you can identify what sort of results you want to show, and you can summarize them and prepare a format. There's certain templates for the for this report functionality in LUSAS, and then you can use the template to produce a report. I mean, obviously you need to edit the report once it's finished, but you can use it nevertheless. Now, in the pre-processing phase, you need to define your problem, and you need to understand your problem from the physical point of view, and then you need to understand your problem from the mathematical point of view. Now, from the physical point of view, I'm, I'm, for example, I'm showing you some, I mean, if you, if you see that in, in this case, I'm showing you examples for bio, biomechanical applications. And biomechanical applications are a sort of applications that you cannot work with, with the standard structure engineering techniques. It will have to be something like the fans and the method. Now, assume that you want to really simulate the, the joints. I mean, you want to design a joint replacement, probably a knee replacement. And this is entirely your responsibility to design this properly. And you, you cannot fail in this type of designs. I mean, this is, this is too, too bad to fail in. Now, in order to be able to do that, you really need to understand the structure of the bones and how this joint would work. And you need to understand the physics of that. Now, from the physical point of view, you need to, first of all, decide if this is going to be a static case and linear static or a dynamic case. I mean, if we're talking about a joint, this is certainly going to be a dynamic case. Then you also need to consider buckling. Should I look into buckling at, at all, or is it not going to be important to consider buckling? And if this is linear, this is great. But if we're talking about biological tissues and biological structures, they are most likely nonlinear. So it's going to be nonlinear static, or I probably in this case, I would think it is going to be nonlinear dynamic. So you need to understand this dynamic behavior because the joint will keep moving. It's, it's not, not a static structure. A human being would always move in the normal cases. And it is going to be a nonlinear type of structure. So this is not going to behave in a linear way. The material properties are not linear. The relation between the stress and the strain is not just as simple as that. It is more complicated. So you really need to understand how the material properties is mainly nonlinearity resulting from the material properties. They 
case for biomechanical applications. Then you need to understand or you need to decide on which part you are really interested in designing. Is it going to be part or the full structure? If we're talking about, again, this joint, are you going to consider the entire human body or are you going to con consider only the arm or are you going to consider only the leg or are you only going to consider the, the knee itself? Is it just the knee or is it the entire leg or is it the entire body? What is it you are going to, to look for? So this is quite a critical decision to make as well, because it is also going to define to what level. I mean, think about a human body, entire human body, where you really have a nonlinear dynamic problem to analyze. I mean, this is going to require a cluster. I don't think you can run this on your personal computer. You would certainly have, I mean, it depends really on the level of details you get into, but probably you are going to need a supercomputer to analyze an entire human body movement in a nonlinear case. So you need to decide on what, what to do with that. But if you are going to only consider the knee, you can fit that onto your personal computer. Well, this is something you can do on a PC. So it is a very important decision to make. And also to what level you want to simplify the problem. And you also need to verify this. So you, you certainly need to consider simplified props and simplified designs. So if we are talking about the knee and nonlinear dynamic, probably you create also another model that is going to be linear and static and two-dimensional, for example, and you verify certain aspects of the problem just to make sure that this is working. So you really look into what sort of simplifications you can get away with and what sort of simplifications you cannot get away with. So I would suggest you go for the full size the problem but before you do that i would do i mean i the way i would do it is i would do simple problems quite a few of them try to understand how the big problem would behave and then i would go into the full size problem and try to run that now running the full size problem is going to take ages but if i don't make any mistakes then at least i would run this once if i have many mistakes in there i need to repeat this quite a few times so the way I, I do this, I would probably approach it first trying to understand simple, simple models, and then I would move into the more complex models. If I do complex models, I mean. You need to understand the material properties, the material models, the constitutive relations. These are very important. And you also need to define the boundary conditions and the loading cases. So if, again, you are designing this replacement knee, then in this case, we really need to know exactly what sort of loads you are going to have in there consider the scenario of someone falling down, for example, or the impact on a knee or the weight carrying that the human is going to carry. All these cases will affect the loading scenarios. And for the boundary conditions, this would also depend really, I mean, having a huge pressure on the knee would certainly change the contact phase in the knee compared to not carrying any weight at all. So these sort of things would also need to be considered. Now, this is the physical side. But from the mathematical side, so as I said, in the pre-processing phase, you need to understand things like the choice of your elements, what choice of elements you would make. I'm talking about, I mean, if you know that this is two-dimensional or three-dimensional, then you need to decide, is it going to be tetrahedron or hexahedron element if it is two-dimensional, triangular, or rectangular elements, or is it going to be linear, quadratic elements? So this would also be something to, to think about. It will also, I mean, if we're talking about dynamic problems, the mesh is going to be distorted to the extent that probably the mesh is not going to be useful. So you need to create remeshing several times. So this is also something for you to decide on. You know that the mesh is going to be distorted to the level that elements are completely squashed into lines, for example. So this mesh is not useful any longer. You have to remesh it in this case, for example. You need to decide on the mesh density, how many elements you need and where to put them and to see how good or bad the quality of your element is, of your element is. And this is all decisions to be made in the pre-processing and the mesh create in the mesh creation phase. And then you need to decide on the solution procedure. I mean, so for example, you create a linear system of equations, just like you did in hand calculations. This linear system of equations will need to be solved. I mean, usually this, I mean, yeah, so you use solution by elimination, for example, in, in the hand calculations. But if you are going to do 
If you are going to do a large system, you cannot do by elimination. So if you are thinking about a system of equations, there is certain techniques to solve that. I mean, this is quite into linear algebra. I don't want to get into linear algebra in this course. So this is why I didn't discuss this in details. But solving this linear system of equations is, is quite a, an important decision to make, and you need to decide on that. For the vast majority of the cases, I would assume that you, you are going to solve this directly using something like Gauss elimination. If you remember the test we had at the start of this course, we had this Gauss elimination question. Now, Gauss elimination can be used for solving a linear system of equations and is, the, is a direct method to solve a linear system of equations. Now, it's very slow compared to other methods we have, but it is also reliable, so it would always work. So these sort of choices you also need to make at the pre-processing phase. Now, one also one important thing for you to, to, to see is to check the sensitivity of your model. I mean, I'm going to, to talk in a minute about verification, but how sensitive is your model would also define how reliable your results is. So make a small change to your model and see how your results is going to change. If you make a small mod a small change and you have a huge change in the results, then in this case, your model is very sensitive and probably I, I wouldn't trust the results I get from this type of model. First, I'm going to talk about the <coughs> choice of the elements. I'm going to show you how the choice of your elements would, would impact on, on your results. We have a cantilever a cantilever that is fixed. And by the way, the examples I'm going to discuss today are all from Robert Cook book, this finite element modeling for stress analysis. I mean, this is, I've got the fourth edition. This is this one here. And it's one of the really, really good books. I mean, if you are a practitioner who is going to use the finite element method, I think this is probably the book for you to read. So, I would certainly recommend it. And as I said, the examples I'm going to show today are actually from this book. Okay, so this is the this is just the first one. Now we have a cantilever. The cantilever is fixed at this end, completely fixed. And on this free end, we have a vertical load applied at point C. We have a concentrated load in the vertical direction applied at point C. Now, the parameters for the problem are given, so this material properties, the length, the dimensions, and the force are all given. And we want to evaluate or solve this problem for the displacement and for the stress. Now, if you look into the vertical displacement calculated Analytically, from the beam theory, you will get that you will get the displacement to be 1.031. This is the vertical displacement. If you look into the stress, the stress should be 300. I mean, this is the theoretical assessment. This is the exact assessment for the find for for the from the beam theory. Now, if you want to do this using the finite element method, using a two-noded beam element. Now, what we did is bar elements. What is used here is the beam element, which is slightly different. So the beam element, one element will give you the exact displacement and the exact stress. Now, if you consider this to be a two-dimensional problem, and you consider two eight-noded elements, so this is quadrilateral element, and this is four, this is quadratic element, so this is quadratic order, and we are using two elements. And see, in this case, we are using so we are using 13 nodes in this case. So the value for the stress is very accurate, and the displacement is also quite accurate, quite comparable to the theoretical case. Now let us instead, I mean, we use instead of 13, we are using two more nodes. And instead of the quadrilateral elements, we are using triangular elements. The triangular elements are quadratic again. Now, this is quadratic. This is a quadratic. This is P2, and this is P2. Is the only difference. In this case, we are using triangular elements. In this case, we are using quadratic elements. Now, if you look into the results, you'll see that the stress is 
significantly lower, and the displacement is also significantly lower. Now, this is, I would say, this is a lot less accurate than in this case here. Now, instead of quadratic, let us use linear elements and use, I mean, see here you have used 13 nodes. In this case, we are using one, two, three, four, five, six. In this case, we are also using, in this case, we are using 12 nodes. So 13 or 12, is not a big difference, but the error is really large in the stress and is also large in the displacement. Now, to improve this, obviously, if you use more and more elements, the numbers will get closer and closer to the theoretical numbers. But using only these 12 nodes will give you a large error. Now, using exactly the same mesh, like in this one, but instead of using these elements to be rectangular shapes, we are changing them into trapezoidal shapes. So we're just distorting the elements. So the quality of these elements is lower than the quality of these elements. If you have these lower quality elements, you'll see that the stress will change and the displacement is overestimated. Now, this is exactly the same number of elements, is the same number of nodes and the same quality of elements, but the results is different. And it is different because we are just using lower quality elements. The same is true for this case. So I'm still using a triangular element. We just distort the mesh. The same, the same number of elements, the same number of nodes, just the mesh is distorted and you have this result. Now, the distortion for a triangular element is not as bad as for a quadrilateral element. So the distortion would have an impact, but it is not as bad as the case of the quadrilateral elements. So the results would change. The underestimation would become even more severe, but is not significantly different. Now, if the quality of your element is really, really poor, then in this case, you would be expecting a big change. But this is not very poor quality element. Now, if you look into the case of this mesh, the same number of elements and the same number of nodes, only distorted mesh, you'll see that this is even worse. And if you consider constant, if you consider triangular elements, we call them constant strain triangle, you'll see that this is a huge drop in the stress and a huge drop in the displacement. And I would say the results in this case completely nonsense. I mean, these results are completely useless. I wouldn't use them. So you see how big the difference is going to be based on your choice of elements the type of these elements and the quality of your mesh. So it is important for you to be careful on what type of elements you, may, you check, uh, so what type of elements you use. And an important element of whatever elements you use, it is always important to check the convergence. Now you have seen convergence in the coursework, the first one when I ask you to do multiple meshes, and you pick something, for example, the maximum stress, and you see how the maximum stress would change with the meshes. So you have the first mesh, you refine the first mesh, you refine it one more time, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, an eighth. And you see that as you are refining, this would converge into something that is not going to change any further. At some point, this would converge into just constant number. I mean, as long as you're not looking at the singularity if you are considering the maximum stress. Now, the maximum stress is probably a bit tricky to look, to look at because, as I said, it can be happening at a singularity. Usually, you would look into something more, more global. There is some measurement for the strain energy in your problem. I mean, Lusas, I think Lusas also can provide you with the strain energy, and this strain energy would represent the entire problem. So it does represent the full size of the problem. It's not a local measurement at one point. Is just for the full thing. And the strain energy would converge usually in a more regular way. So if you look into the stress, you'll see that this point here, I mean, I mean, if you look into this one and this one, you'll see that this change is small, but then the third one, the stress is going to jump again. So this is why you check three points usually and make sure that these three points are leading into similar results because this can happen if you are taking local measurement. Whereas if you look into the global 
measurement, you see that this would converge and the change would become slower at the convergence phase. And you don't have these jumps or kinks into the convergence. So this is why it is preferred to look into a global convergence measurement, like the strain energy. Now, how to refine your mesh? You have usually two strategies. The strategy that is mostly available in commercial packages is the edge convergence, but you can also do the P convergence. I'm going to, to show you what I mean with the edge convergence and the P convergence. Let us assume that you have this beam. We have this cost. This one here. Let us assume that you want really to, to check the convergence. So you start by using two elements. And then you split these elements into more elements. Now, it is important to remember that, see, this is the original nodes. And then this is the next generation of nodes. Now, if you want to, if you notice, I've reduced H. H is the size of this edge. H usually would refer to the size of your elements in the finite element literature. I have divided H into H half. So the second mesh is H half. Now, I mean, this is, this is, the, this is the cleanest way for the convergence, to check the convergence. You, you divide it into a second mesh. You do just the same thing. So you divide this into one quarter, and then you have a third generation of nodes, and so on. Now, what is, what is the important thing in this case to observe to avoid any, any uh, impact from the local changes in the mesh is you see that the nodes of the previous mesh or the nodes of the first generation would still be part of the next mesh. So the node of the first generation will be part of the first mesh, the second, and the third. The node of the second generation would be part of the second and the third mesh. And the node of the third generation obviously will be only nodes of the third mesh. But if you have a fourth refinement, the node of the third generation would still be there. So you don't replace the mesh. I mean, alternatively, you, can, you could have done that. So this is the first mesh. And you want to refine this. So instead of doing this, or instead of refining the mesh itself, you just create another mesh. I mean, this is, this is the mesh. And I probably do three elements instead of doing Now, compared to the first one, you'll see that these nodes here are not part of the new generation. I'm not, not part of the new generation of nodes. Now, these ones are still the same, still there, but these ones are lost. So probably, and it can happen, just in this case, usually in, in the coursework, this node would be at the center of your beam, and these nodes would be on top of the maximum stress and they will have some advantage being at the mid length. Now, if you go to the second mesh, you see that the second mesh, you don't have any nodes at the center. And in between these nodes, I mean, this maximum stress is happening between these two nodes. And in between these nodes, you are doing interpolation. So you may miss the peak that is happening at the mid length. So this is why you always keep the same nodes and you add on top of them. You don't replace them with, some, with something else. So this is the standard edge refinement procedure to check the convergence. Now, alternatively, I'm going again to use the same mesh. So alternatively, you do the P refinement. So this is the first, or this is your first mesh. And it's split into and this split into quadrilateral elements, four-noded, it is linear. Now, the next 
mesh is going to be still two elements, but instead of linear, use quadratic elements. Now the third mesh, I probably need to remove this. The third mesh is going to be cubic. And so on. So you add more nodes, but you keep the same number of elements. So this is called the P refinement. This is the P refinement. And this is the edge refinement. All right. And for the edge convergence or the P convergence, you will get some behavior like this. And you would always prefer to go for a non local measurement for the convergence. Do you have any questions so far? All right, so another example from Cook book. So this is the, I think this is quite an eye-opening example. I mean, it was for me quite an eye-opening example. I think it also would have some impact on you. Now, this example is for a plate. You have a thin plate, has a certain dimension, 200 millimeters, and the thickness is four millimeters and the width is 20 millimeters. So this plate is hinged at this end and at this end, and it is free to vibrate. Now, this plate has undergone a pressure pulse. The pressure, pu pressure pulse has lasted for one millisecond. Now, this problem, I mean, the, the, the author of this book, has given this problem to 10 professional finite element package users. I mean, he asked 10 people who are considered professional users of their own packages. Everyone has a different finite element package to use, but they are considered professional users in their own packages. So this problem was passed to these 10 users. And it was, I mean, it was asked of, it was asked from them to try and model the behavior, the oscillations that happen within this plate. Now, every one of them went into modeling the plate, applied the pulse, and then reported the displacement. Now, if you look into these curves here, you'll see the number referring to the software package. So software package one has this dotted line, so this is for package one, it is the dotted line. 3B and 3A are pretty much the same package, but under different assumptions. So this is 3B, this is a 3C, and here, I can't find 3A here. Okay, but you get the point. So this is, this is one, this is two, this is a three and four, and five and 10, All right? So you have 10 curves. Each one of these users produced curves. Now for the first millisecond, pretty much all of them overlap, but starting from the first millisecond onward, you'll see that every single one of them produced a different curve. Now, if, if any of these is correct, it's going to be really difficult to tell it to tell which one it is, but it might be also the case that all of them are wrong. So this is the danger of using the finite element method, that you produce something you think it is correct, but there's no way to check if it is correct in many cases. So I would suggest have a look into this example. I'm, I'm going to leave you two chapters from this book on Canvas. I would suggest probably have a look into them. So to check your results, 
I so for example, uh, I'm I'm going to go back. I mean, if if you want to check the first part, probably the first part is relatively easy to check in terms of the vibrations happening within the because it is forced vibration and it is possible to, to verify. Now, from this point onwards, it is free vibrations and free vibrations can happen in different ways. Now, it is not going to be possible unless someone will experimentally run this and produce some results and repeat the experiment. Few times, always get exactly the same results. And then this would be considered the correct results and it can be used to verify which one is the correct one. But at the same time, this is not always possible for, I mean, you, you want to design a, a building for an earthquake load and you assume a certain type of earthquake, but there is no way that anyone is going to apply this earthquake on your building and, and check the behavior and make sure that this is how the response is going to happen in real life. I mean, these sort of checks are going to be really difficult to, to do. Alternatively, we try to do simpler checks. And this is how to get confidence in your finite element results. I mean, you can check the deflections, look into the reactions, stresses. This is something you can, as I said, look at in general terms. If you have buckling, then you can look into the buckling mode shapes. So for any structure, you can identify buckling mode shapes and the buckling should happen within these mode shapes. If you have a dynamic problem, you can look into natural frequencies and you look into shape, natural mode shapes, basically, and see if this would be actually something relevant to the model you have. And this would be in terms of the usual output or the standard output. You would also look into simplified models. So do some hand calculations on a simple model and try to verify that. Or you do simple finite element model and verify using the simple finite element model. So if it is a three-dimensional case, try to reduce it into a two-dimensional model and see if the two-dimensional model will still give you similar results. I mean, not exactly the same results, but just a proper approximations for these results. So this can be something you do. And then certainly check equilibrium, see if the reactions will add up to the full amount of load and if the deflections are happening as expected. So if you apply the force downward, then the body should be actually displaced downward. If it moves upward, then there's something probably not correct in, in there. So you need to check that. So this would be in general the type of checks you need to do every time you use the finite element method. You also can look into the results. I mean, doing visual checks, you certainly need to see the unsmoothed Contour plots. This is something you need to do. The sensitivity analysis, do some sensitivity. I mean, just some sensitivity analysis. This is also an important check and, and relatively an easy one to do. Make a small change. I mean, for example, you have 1000 kilonewton load on your structure and you are getting 50 megapascal as a stress response. Now, if you increase this 1000 to 1001, and then the stress will increase to 5,000 megapascal, you really should question your results and you should question your model. Is it actually producing any meaningful results or is some fundamental mistakes in there? And usually if the model is very sensitive, I wouldn't trust the results of this model. Also, if you change the mesh and the change is going to be dramatic and your model, I mean, it's not converging, it's not that you refine it, the results will change, and then the change will become smaller, and then the change will become smaller. Yeah, this sort of change is expected. But if you change, for example, from a converged solution, if you change one element, for example, and split this element into four elements, instead of having 1,000 elements, you have 1,002 elements, for example. If this new mesh will, again, completely produce different set of results, I wouldn't trust this finite element model. So sensitivity, Checks are really important. And I would always do that whenever I do a finite element model. And then you need to read the output of your finite element model. So you need to plot the deformed shape or the displaced shape, contour plots for different stresses. If you have velocity, for example, if you're talking about the fluid flow, you have vector plots or force plots. And usually the displaced shapes are relatively the, the most 
the most easy to check. I mean, it should be should be relatively easy to expect the type of deformations you have for a search on load. I mean, this, this should be relatively easy. I'm going to discuss some examples later, which are going to, to probably help you see what I mean about the displaced shapes and the stress and control plots. Now, one thing which would make perfect sense, which would be really very useful to do, but we cannot do all the time, is doing experimental checks. So you verify your results using some experimental checks. So this would also be a useful thing to do. 